Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums... Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Ross Safari Zoo News, your look at everything going on in the world of zoos, aquariums, conservation, and general animal weirdness. Y'all, my time in Raleigh is over, and doing my show there was such a treat. Audiences absolutely loved it. We got some great reviews and comments from the fans. And uh, both Colin, one of the guys in the group, and I had friends come out to see the show on multiple nights, which meant the world to me. I even had some people who who know me through Ross Safari make the trek, and, and that was really cool. I also got to spend three days at the Greensboro Science Center, a day at the North Carolina Zoo, and a day at the WNC Nature Center, all of which you'll hear about in upcoming episodes. Then I went to right outside the D.C. area and caught up with my parents, which of course included a visit to the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. That's one of those facilities that I haven't been able to get into yet for the podcast, but I've made a lot of friends there and have many listeners there, so I got to have a really special trip to the National Zoo. In fact, I was told on good authority that there is a very good chance that a bit of a changing of the guard there may lead to the ability to finally have that incredible facility on the podcast. We shall see, of course, but I really would love to share them with y'all. Because I have to say, every time I'm there, I get to talk to incredible people and see incredible animals, and I've been behind the scenes all over that zoo, and it is a team and a facility that is very worth sharing. And now, uh, as this episode drops, I'm going to be hanging out with Miles, and then it is finally time. I will be heading back to the Buffalo area. I've done my orientation, and on Sunday, I'll be heading to my first actual shift as an animal team volunteer at Aquarium of Niagara. I'm excited to get my hands dirty, quite literally, in a different way in this world of zoos and aquariums. I'm sure it's going to be a super interesting experience, and I I look forward to learning how to get fish smells off my hands. And elsewhere, probably. Oh, and one final bit of exciting news. We have now officially crossed half a million downloads of the Raw Safari podcast. That is such an insane number. I remember when I started this, I thought that if uh, if we got 10,000 downloads before it all fell apart, um, that would be a miracle. That was like my dream. I wanted 10,000 downloads, preferably in a year. And I really wasn't sure if the podcast would keep existing for a variety of reasons. So that was my goal. And here we are at 500,000 downloads. Here's to many, many more. All right. For those of you who are newer to the podcast, this is Rossafari Zoo News. So we're going to go through a bunch of news stories about zoos and conservation and other news and all that good stuff. It is a crowdsourced news program, meaning that if you see anything that you think would be zoo news worthy, you can tag me in it on socials at Ross Safari or email it to me, rossafaripod at gmail.com. And whether I use your story or not, I'll say your name at the end of the episode. What a thrill for you. Uh, That was sarcastic. But actually, I've had some people tell me that it is a bit of a thrill for them. So I guess the sooner I shut my mouth, the sooner y'all can get to that thrill. So uh, let's get into it, y'all.
All right. So uh, today is actually Thursday, shortly before this episode is going to drop, and and I already had this bad boy recorded. But I do need to break in here at the top of the Zoo News section because we had some breaking news this week, and I wanted to make sure that y'all saw it. Uh, The San Diego Zoo has officially announced that they will be receiving giant pandas again. They're going to be continuing their research on the species at the San Diego Zoo and getting them on loan from China again. As you know, probably, this is a really big deal because um, basically worldwide, all of the pandas have been called home at the end of their leases. For instance, in the United States right now, Zoo Atlanta is the only place that has uh, their panda bears, and the expectation is that they are going to be sent back to China at the uh, end of the lease, which is sometime this year. So the fact that China has now decided that San Diego is able to have pandas again, well, that's a pretty big deal. Does it mean that the Zoo Atlanta pandas will be staying? No, but it opens the door to that. I know from talking to people at Zoo Atlanta that they think that they're going to get to keep their bears, but, um, you know, that was all wishful, hopeful thinking and, and had no actual reasoning behind it. Does this mean that the National Zoo in D.C. will be getting panda bears again? Hard to say, but uh, those exhibits are still empty, and I know they're there doing some very visible construction work on them right now. So whether they're getting them ready for another species or whether they're making them even better for their next set of panda bears. It's hard to say. But uh, this is a really big deal for the fans of the panda bear, and I wanted to share it with y'all. I think this might be the start of the next wave of panda diplomacy, and to have it officially confirmed and confirmed by the San Diego Zoo is phenomenal. So yay that. And that brings us to our births this week. Okay, we're going to start off, as we always do, with our births for the week. Uh, A baby ray has been born with quite the twist. The mother is a ray, but the father is a shark. (laughs) Just kidding, just kidding. Uh, But hey, if you don't get the joke or what I'm talking about right now, make sure you listen to last week's episode, uh, because I had a lot of fun taking down this thing that's gone kind of viral for not great reasons uh, right now. And actually, um, that episode really popped off, and I've been told by a lot of keepers who have have had family members or friends ask them about it since like they read about it online and know that the person is a keeper. Uh, th- those people just referred them to my episode to to kind of explain it, uh, which which really means a lot to me. I'm glad that I was able to provide that service and make everyone laugh. So, uh, OK, let's move on to actual births this week. Two new king penguins have hatched at the Kansas City Zoo, uh, which have been named Clay and Jackie. Now, normally, I would say that these should be called king penglets, but do we make the exception and just say they are princess penglets since they are the daughters of king penguins? Uh, I'm such a goober. Anyway, the names, which are technically Clay and Jackson, come from the two counties that make up the zoological district that supports the zoo through a one eighteenth of a cent sales tax that voters approved. And this is the zoo's way of thanking the people of those counties, which I think is adorable. Not going to lie, the Kansas City Zoo has been uh, coming on strong lately, doing a lot of things I really love, and uh, moving very, very far up the list of facilities I haven't made it to that I really, really want to visit. Oh, and speaking of new penguins, the Memphis Zoo has announced the birth of Frodo, the 49th African penguin chick to hatch at the zoo. His parents are Betty and Pippin, so the Lord of the Rings theme is going strong at the Memphis Zoo. The San Diego Zoo Safari Park has announced the birth of a greater one-horned rhino calf to Mother Alta. The rhinelet is already showing an incredibly spunky personality and is growing quickly. Mother and baby are currently not on exhibit, but soon enough you'll be able to see this little baby unicorn in the Asian Plains section of the Safari Park. The Fort Worth Zoo has announced the birth of Corbel, a giraffelet. He was born standing tall at 6 feet 3 inches and is already exhibiting a very deep interest in enrichment items presented to him. 
Congrats to the team. Our friends at the Nashville Zoo have announced the birth of a southern Tamandua pup. The Tamandlet will be raised behind the scenes with her mom and will most likely become part of the next generation of Tamandua ambassadors at the zoo. Meaning that uh, this little one will be working with my buddy Jake Belair and that team and that I'll probably get to go say hi at some point. I am so excited. I love their ambassador Tams so much. Not like, you know, as much as their ambassador Binturongs. Uh, hi, Wilbur. Hi, Willow. I love you. I just assume that Binturongs listen to my podcast. Uh, where, where were we? Oh, yes. And then last but not least in the births this week, the London Zoo has announced the birth of a critically endangered Western lowland gorilla. And you may be thinking, oh, John, it's finally happened. You're reporting on something you already talked about recently. But nope, this is the second gorilla born at the zoo recently. Both of the babies have the same father, their silverback, but have different mothers. Yay, baby gorillas. And that brings us to the deaths section. Our friends at ABQ Biopark in Albuquerque have announced the passing of Tonka the orangutan. Tonka was 44 years old and was the second oldest male Sumatran orangutan in human care in the United States at the time of his passing. He lived at the zoo for over three decades and passed away due to kidney disease. What an amazing long life. I, I'm always so sad when the old ones go because geriatric animals are just really special. But uh, it, it always takes the sting away a little bit to know how amazing the life was and how long it was. Uh, now, we have to talk about an animal who has moved onto this list after so recently being on the previous one. PJ, or Parker Jr., the giraffe calf recently born at Seneca Park Zoo, has passed away. As a quick refresher, PJ was born to Capenzi, a giraffe at the zoo with a squamous cell carcinoma growth on her jaw, which is inoperable. In announcing the death, the zoo made it clear that the issue had nothing to do with PJ's passing. Instead, encephalitis, an infection of the tissue around the brain, is what did PJ in. The infection appears to have been bacterial, but lab results to confirm exactly what happened are still a few weeks away. I feel so badly for the draft team at the zoo who are going through this loss and Capenzi's medical condition. Sending all the love. And speaking about teams that are going through it, the Pittsburgh Zoo has announced the passing of Seahawk, also known as Hawk. Hawk was an 18 year old sea lion. He passed away suddenly after exhibiting strange behaviors and refusing food for multiple days. His unusual behaviors made it so he was unable to participate in his own diagnostics and care, despite his training to do so, and as such, the vet team proceeded with a routine sedation. However, likely due to his illness, Hawk had an adverse reaction to the anesthetic and did not survive the procedure. I know I've said it on here before, but Outside of cats and dogs, any anesthesia of any animal is a bit of a crapshoot since we don't have nearly the research into other species as we do into domestics. It is often a necessary crapshoot, as it was in this case. The vet team absolutely made the right choice, and it has to have been so hard for them to experience this loss in this way. This is why the mental health of veterinarians is such an issue. This is why the Not One More Vet organization exists, because of the increased rate of death by suicide of veterinarians. I feel so much for the team at the zoo. So much love, so much frustration, um, not at them, but on their behalf, and, and so much fear for what people will be saying. This is the third major loss at the zoo in this week, as we reported on the loss of a baby elephant due to EEHV and a silverback gorilla at the zoo last week. While all of these events are very clearly not linked, and while EEHV and old age, which is what took the silverback down, are both causes of death that are expected at zoos and, and, and natural, um, and hey, they happen in the wild too, uh, despite all of that, this is a really tough time for the team at the Pittsburgh Zoo. 
I'm actually incredibly impressed that the zoo closed for a day after these losses to give their staff a bit of uh, a mental health day. They had to go and do the work, but they got to avoid guests and just spend their own time mourning. This was such a great move by a great facility. Sending all my love and respect and support to the Pittsburgh Zoo during such an incredibly hard time of loss. And then that brings us to the rest of our zoo news for the week. I just really love mixed species exhibits, y'all. And the Santa Barbara Zoo is trying a mixed species exhibit I'm really excited about. Their red panda Raj is getting some roommates, two Burmese mountain tortoises. The introductions are happening this month and are being done slowly and being closely monitored, but the hope is that the species will be able to exist happily together. Mixed species exhibits provide for more natural settings for the animals and also provide a form of novel enrichment for each species. This is the first I've heard of a red panda getting tortoise friends, so I look forward to seeing how it goes and hope that Raj and the Torts become BFFs and then start a band because Raj and the Torts is actually a really good band name. And speaking of red pandas, I know you're shocked to be getting more red panda news. Something that we have been talking about as a possibility for months has finally come to fruition. Along with the Red Panda SSP, the ACA has announced the formation of a Red Panda SAFE program, saving animals from extinction. Now, if you listened to Rossafari After Dark with Maxine Van Dam this month, you know that both of us were surprised this was in the works because the SSP already functions in ways similar to SAFE programs, and because Red Panda Network is partnered with so many AZA-accredited zoos and is doing incredible conservation work in the field. Well, it turns out that the SAFE program is going to be partnering with Red Panda Network to function as a single team. So with the breeding program still handled by the SSP, I'm honestly not entirely sure what the new Red Panda SAFE program will be doing yet. I went onto the AZA's website and and logged in as a member and everything, and they don't have any documentation up, so I wasn't able to learn more yet. But I will be curious to see where all the lines get drawn between the SSP, the uh, SAFE program, and Red Panda Network. But look, at the end of the day, if this helps with in-situ Red Panda conservation at a deeper level, or even if it just formalizes the work already being done, I am all for it. And uh, it's going to be really exciting to watch this develop over time. And still sticking with red pandas, I'm so happy right now. The Hertfordshire Zoo in the UK has announced the arrival of Ash, a new red panda who is there to be a companion to beloved Tilly. You may remember that Tilly gave birth to Tashi, who is known as Little Red and the Miracle Panda when he was born shortly after his father's passing. Well, now Tilly will have a new friend in Ash, and hopefully more cubs will follow. Y'all, in retrospect, I might I might be a little too interested in Red Panda genealogy here, but, well, I guess that is a conversation for me and my therapist. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. Which is a stuffed red panda named Red. But I digress. Uh, And actually, we are going to uh, stick with pandas for even a moment longer here. But this time we are talking about the other pandas, the giant pandas, which, oh, holy crap. Okay, this reminds me of something I heard at a zoo recently that I have to share. Then we'll get back to the story. 
So I'm hanging out at a red panda exhibit at a zoo. Shocker, I know. And a mother and daughter walk up. The mom says, look, honey, red pandas, just like in the movie Turning Red. Good so far. But then she goes on to say, except the one in Turning Red was actually a giant panda because it was so much larger than these little ones. So that's what giant pandas look like. And then these are the red pandas. And y'all, my brain short circuited. And you know I love sharing information when a person seems open to it at a zoo, especially correcting misinformation. But my brain was broken, and I just couldn't wrap my head around how she had managed to get both types of pandas so perfectly correct, while also being so wildly wrong. So I just sat there with my eyes opened to the size of saucers while they walked on happily. And, you know, just to be clear here, I'm not mocking the mom for being confused. It it, it happens. We're not all huge red panda experts, despite my best intentions. It's just that the specific confusion in question was so amusing to me. Um, it, It just the whole it was a giant panda, but it was a red panda, but it was a red giant panda. I don't know. Anyway, back to the actual story at hand. Keepers at Chengdu Base in China have recently revealed that some panda bears fake pregnancy in order to get the benefits that pregnant pandas get, such as an increased diet and increased attention. Specifically, the pandas in question are all ones that experience pseudo-pregnancies. Panda bears that are not pregnant will sometimes show hormonal and behavioral changes that are consistent with what is seen in pregnancies, but there will be no fetus and oftentimes has not even been any breeding behavior. This is known as a pseudo-pregnancy and can last for uh, two months or so, and it seems that some of the bears at Chengdu Base really like the extra food and attention showered onto them during these pseudo-pregnancies and even after their hormone levels return to normal, still act like they are experiencing the pseudo-pregnancies. Researchers believe this is a learned behavior from the bears that want to continue to receive special treatment, which is both adorable and kind of devious. And uh, sticking with bears for a moment, but moving away from pandas, the Louisville Zoo has announced a new polar bear joining the family, And this is way more exciting than just the standard, an animal is moving to a new facility type situation. Over many of the episodes of the podcast, you've heard me talk about the weird laws about polar bears in the United States and how they complicate the ability of accredited zoos to care for and breed the species, and especially to ensure the genetic diversity of the species. A lot of these issues stem from a law from 2008 that was horribly written and that had the goal of protecting polar bears, but the practical execution created many issues along with also providing many protections for the species. Part of this law states that all bears that are rescued in the U.S. are the Fish and Wildlife Service's property and are excluded from breeding. This includes the female polar bear at the Louisville Zoo, Kinnick? I think it's Kanik, maybe Kanik. I think it's Kanik. It's Q-A-N-N-I-K. I I couldn't find a a video that that stated it. I apologize. Anyway, um, we're going with Kanik. Uh, And Kanik has wildly valuable genetics since she is wild born, but has not been allowed to breed because of that law. However, The policy seems to have changed recently. You may remember my obituary for, and then the episode that included information about, Peyton, the polar bear that was heading to Louisville uh, from the North Carolina Zoo to breed with uh, Kanik. Well, it was lost on me at the time as I was mourning Peyton, but the fact that he was heading there at all meant that the policy must have changed and that the female was going to be allowed to breed. And now another bear has made the trip for that same purpose. Borealis, commonly known as Bo, has traveled from the Henry Vilas Zoo to Louisville to hopefully be a mate for Canuck, and uh, that would be a huge help for the genetic diversity of the polar bear population in human care. I am really excited about this move. 
Now, obviously, there are a lot of challenges with polar bear reproduction in general. Um, and if you haven't heard my episode with Dr. Aaron Curry of Crew at the Cincinnati Zoo, uh, you can you can get a, a good look at some of those issues. Um, so there's no guarantee this will be a success. But uh, more than just the breeding wreck, the apparent change in the laws that are causing the zoo-based population of polar bears such difficulty is a huge win for the species. And having two polar bears together that could mate is a huge win for the Louisville Zoo. So while this change to policy seems rather sudden to those of us observing from the outside, I would be remiss not to point out that the AZA and many incredible scientists and polar bear keepers have been pushing for this change for a long time, taking the necessary steps to get fish and wildlife to allow this to happen. What an incredible amount of behind-the-scenes work done by individuals that I, I looked. I can't even find the name of, of who did it. But uh, I do want to say thank you to everyone who was involved. All right. This one's going to be a less happy note. So for the second time recently, a Sequest aquarium has been shut down following multiple complaints and citations for animal welfare issues. This Sequest was in Littleton, Colorado. The Denver Zoo has announced that they have rescued 130 animals from the closed facility, including a keel-billed toucan, red-necked wallabies, African pancake tortoises, a blue skink, and numerous aquatic species. Many of the species are new to the Denver Zoo, so this is a huge undertaking for them. Many of the animals are not visible to the public yet, but will be soon, and some that are already visible have signage up stating that the animals are clearly not in great shape, but that they should heal up as they acclimate to their new home. I am so grateful to the Denver Zoo for this. And I have to be honest here. This is a really bad look for Sequest. This is the second time that a Sequest Aquarium has shut down recently after being cited with multiple animal welfare issues following a closure in Connecticut. It makes me wonder, what is going on with this company? Now, I've talked to keepers at a few of their facilities, and I have to say this. Everyone I have spoken to is dedicated to animal welfare, trying to do the best they can, and honestly, really passionate about caring for their animals and about animal conservation. I know multiple Sequest employees listen to this podcast, and of those I have talked to, their passion rivals that of anyone that I've had as a guest on Raw Safari. The company has locations still uh, in Utah, Texas, Las Vegas, New Jersey, California, Minnesota, and Virginia, and I just have a hard time believing that all of these facilities are just filled with animal abuse cases and evil people because, again, I literally know that is not the case. But I would love to hear from Vince Covino, the founder and CEO of the company, or from anyone in upper management, really, about what is going on. The public deserves to know, and frankly, the teams at the other facilities with the Sequest moniker deserve to know what is going on with the company. I've heard that they have plans to expand the brand with a new aquarium location already scouted. I can only hope that the issues in Colorado and Connecticut aren't prevalent in all of the facilities. Maybe it's just the ones in states that start with a C. And that Vince will work to make sure that his facilities that aren't doing so start to treat their animals with the dignity, respect, and love that they so deserve. I also personally hope to get to one of the Sequest locations in the near future to take a look for myself and... If I am able to, I will share my thoughts with you all. I have been to a few already, but it was before I learned about all of this stuff uh, through doing the podcast, so I don't want to comment on experiences from years ago that were seen through the eyes of someone who was honestly completely unaware of what he was seeing, good or bad. Until then, I'd actually really love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Y'all know you can reach out about anything to do with the podcast or Zoo Newsy type stuff, but uh, I'd, I'd really love to hear what you think about this, and especially if you have any experience with the Sequest brand, or, you know, if you happen to work for them. Any chats can be on or off the record. I just, I just really want to figure out what's going on here. 
Oh, and speaking of animal welfare issues, uh, though not from a zoo this time, the Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha has had to remind people to stop throwing coins in the water of their exhibits after their vet team had to remove 70 coins from the stomach of a Thibodeau, a 36-year-old leucistic American alligator who lives at the zoo. Ugh, I hate people sometimes. Uh, the vet team did amazing work removing the 70 coins and guiding the gator to a healthy recovery, so I guess I only hate some people because I love that vet team. But dang, how dumb do you have to be to try to get some, what, good luck by throwing coins into an animal habitat? I know people worry that anti-zoo groups will eventually win and end zoos in this country or even worldwide, but to me, the biggest risk to continuing to have zoos, or at least continuing to have zoos with exhibits that really make us feel close to the animals, are the stupid people who do dumb crap like this. I'll leave this topic at that for now, but this is the kind of stuff that really drives me crazy, y'all. And we're going to end this segment with some quick hits. The Columbus Zoo has announced Unextinct, a nighttime adventure through the zoo that will be opening in March of this year. You walk through immersive pathways that use light displays to show long extinct animals roaming the pathways and also get to see exciting and interesting lighting throughout the zoo. While there isn't a ton of information about the event available at this time, I look forward to learning more and then attending once it is open, possibly for my birthday, which is also in March. The Edmonton Valley Zoo in Canada has announced the acquisition of two new Arctic wolves who traveled to the zoo from France. They will be joining Tundra, the Arctic wolf who is already at the zoo, to form a new pack. Hopefully introductions go well after quarantine, and Tundra will bond well with his new, apparently French-speaking, pack mates. And last but not least, Timothy the Hippo at the San Antonio Zoo is running for president, the zoo announced this week. Uh, from courting Fiona from a distance, to running for president, uh, seems that Timothy really, really does do it all. Presentation! Presentation! News time! Oh yeah! We have a new species alert, and it is a weird and adorable one. Asia has red pandas, Asia has giant pandas, and now Asia has skeleton pandas. And I'm not talking about fossils. Although I guess they have those too. But instead, a recently identified species has been named the skeleton panda sea squirt, and it's a tiny sea creature that lives up to its name. It has a skeleton-like body structure and black markings on its otherwise white face that resemble the markings of panda bears. The white bone-looking structures that give it the skeleton part of its name are actually blood vessels that run through the gills. The black parts that make the face look panda-esque are just markings, and scientists have no clue why a sea squirt would have such markings. But as it is a newly discovered species, there hasn't been much investigation into them. It is a really awesome and unique looking species with a really awesome and unique name, so I highly recommend looking it up. We've talked a lot on here recently about the fact that rhino poaching has been down all across Africa, and there is some more great news on that front, this time from Zimbabwe. 2023 is the first year this century that the government did not have to undertake any emergency interventions against poachers. This is due to increased intelligence and anti-poaching investments by the government and, of course, the conservation community. What an amazing win for rhinos. And now, on the other side of things, sometimes I think we are living in the dumbest timeline. Other times, I know we are living in the dumbest timeline. Especially in Florida, where a congressman named Jason Schoaf has introduced a bill that would allow citizens to kill black bears claiming self-defense. The argument he is making is not centered around normal bears, but to quote the congressman, we're talking about the ones that are on crack and they break your door down and they're standing in your living room growling and tearing your house apart. It turns out from other quotes that the congressman made it clear that he is not joking and is genuinely concerned about bears on crack. Sir, 
though, though it is loosely, loosely based on a true event, the movie Cocaine Bear was largely fictional. Crack bears aren't a thing. It's, it's actually even a less catchy phrase than cocaine bears. Get it together, Congressman Schof, please. Oh, and while we are talking about dumb and crazy things, both terms fit both Congressman Schoaf, from all indications, and bears on cocaine. A man in Montana is facing felony charges for selling illegally hybridized offspring of cloned Marco Polo sheep. The man is named Arthur Schubarth, and the sheep were cloned by him. Illegally. My dude just dropped $4,200 and illegally imported Marco Polo sheep into Montana, then illegally cloned them, and then illegally started selling the offspring. Along with selling the offspring, he is also charged with selling straws full of semen of the illegally cloned sheep. By the time Shubarth was caught, he had been running a multi-state illegal sheep trafficking ring for 11 years, and honestly... I don't even know where to begin with this. I don't know what price tag I would have expected for an illegal sheep cloning operation, but I guarantee you that it would be higher than $4,200. And then the fact that just every step of this was illegal. The import of the sheep, illegal. The cloning, illegal. The interstate commerce, illegal. The straws of semen, illegal. They were illegal straws of semen. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon, how did it go extinct? Hey, it's me, Boris Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. Also, the fact that the felony charges just casually mention straws of semen. That's crazy. Straws of semen, y'all. Add to it the fact that I doubt my dude is using reusable straws, and this all just amounts to an absolute affront to science and nature. It seems less like a real story and more like a failed comic book character. The all-new, all-powerful, sheep-cloning, woolen warrior and his flock of fury. Uh, But it also makes me wonder, all joking aside, if cloning is this cheap and can be accomplished in such a simplistic and haphazard way, what else is coming down the pike? What other types of cloning and hybridization crimes will be committed? I'm entertained by this story because of, well... Because of all the reasons I just said. Straws of semen, y'all. But I'm also finding myself deeply disturbed by the implications here. I'll be curious to see if we end up talking about more stuff like this uh, over time. And last, but not least in conservation news, I always find discussions about the human impact on the environment to be so fascinating, in part because it is actually really hard to think about the bigness of everything. The the numbers are insane and hard to comprehend because you are literally talking about a worldwide problem. So when I saw this little factoid, I thought it summed everything up so perfectly. We always talk about the fact that there is so much of our world, especially our oceans, that we don't really know about. Well, a beer bottle was recently discovered at Challenger Deep, which is the deepest point on Earth that we know of. Think of that. Our trash has literally traveled to a place that is as far away from humans as it is possible to be on this planet. It's it's honestly staggering to comprehend. Though, to be fair, we haven't developed that area yet. No one else is around. There's no internet down there. And if you're there, you're constantly living under pressure. So maybe it does make sense to have a beer at the end of the day. But dang, recycle it, dude. It's time for other news. It's time for other news. Hey, no, right now, then now it's time. It's time for other news. Hey, it's a segue to the podcast. 
A 34-year-old man in Colorado died four days after being bitten by one of his pet Gila monsters. This is surprising because while Gila monsters are venomous, the bites are not normally fatal to humans. In fact, the last known human death from such a bite was recorded in 1930. Experts believe that the death may have been because of an allergic reaction to the venom rather than due to the potency of the venom itself. A good reminder that when handling venomous pets, one must always be careful, even if you don't assume that the interaction could turn fatal. You never know. And then last but not least, uh, bats can sing love songs. Apparently. Maybe. Well, some of them. Okay, I should probably say more than just the headline here. We all know that bats use echolocation to navigate and hunt and all the cool things that they do. But back in 2010, a recording was made of silver-haired bats vocalizing, something that bats had never been recorded doing before. Researchers were able to tell that the sounds were not echolocation because they were used in different ways than echolocation, but they weren't able to interpret the sounds, in part because they were made at frequencies that humans can't hear. However, with advances of technology, the sounds were able to be digitally manipulated so that they could be heard and interpreted by human scientists recently, and research and observation has confirmed that the sounds are truly used as songs. And not just any songs, but courtship ritual songs. In other words, to anthropomorphize to an offensive level, the bats were singing love songs. And while this is just one species of bat, it's quite possible that many or even all bat species use similar songs during courtship and that we just haven't realized it because we can't hear them. In, uh, in, in, in fact, the night could be as full of bat song as the day is of bird song, but our stupid human ears j just can't hear it. More research will be done on the topic, but I find this fascinating, and I hope that as this knowledge spreads, it helps people that are afraid of bats to stop being afraid and start connecting with them instead. Oh, animal, oh, animal, animal holidays, animal, oh, animal, animal holidays. Hey! All right, it's time to wrap up February for our animal holidays. Uh, and February is a couple of animal months, including National Bird Feeding Month, International Hoof Care Month, Fishing Cat February, and Adopt a Rescue Rabbit Month. Then we only have two individual days this week, uh, one of which actually isn't even a day. Uh, the 26th launches National Invasive Species Week, which is a whole week, hence the name Week. And then the 27th is International Polar Bear Day. And those are your animal holidays for the week. All right, folks, there you have it. Another week of Rossafari Zoo News is done. And um, I want to take a moment to remind you all that we do have a Patreon. You can support the pod for as little as $3 a month by going to patreon.com slash Rossafari. And uh, if you become a patron, I'll say thank you. And if you become a Red Panda level patron, I'll say at the end of each episode, hey, I'd like to say thank you to my Red Panda level patrons, including Dr. Laura Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett, and Jenny Owens. And then we can insert your name there too. Isn't that exciting? I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who contributed this week. Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley Croninger, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Jacob Zinn, Barbara Bennett, Crystal Chapman, Emily Rockbuck, Kristen Khalil, the Angel of Death, Dr. Laura Shank, Dr. Megan Owens, Elizabeth Charles, yes. Anne Yoshioka, Matt Patford, Becca Robinson, Karen Musklow, Elizabeth Dunlevy, Justin Williams, Ali Malensky, Kay Malensky, the Malenskys. Oh, it's so bad when I start it too high. And actually, 
I know that you've all been very worried. I have some very good news for you. It turns out that despite getting married, Kay has decided to keep her last name. It was a tough decision, but she ended up deciding that she didn't want to lose her little podcast jingle here. So her and Allie talked and they decided that it was better to just keep the last name so I could keep singing the Malenskis. It's so much better when it's in my range. And while that may not be true about the name thing, that's what Allie told me Kay decided and I'm sticking with it. Anyway, moving on from there, Katie Prop and Sarah Evans. Thank you all so much for contributing this week. I will be back here on Tuesday, and I know you will be too, as we do another interview from Australia, and then another Zoo News will be coming at you on Friday. And actually, keep your eyes on your feed. There is a chance that I'm going to be dropping something a little different and a little special this week, so uh, we'll see. But Maybe if you're real good this weekend, maybe I'll come through with a treat for y'all. Anyway, remember, friends, the words Newsy Credits Backwards are Steider Yiswen. The Rossafari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo. And there is some more Nate Groove. That was supposed to be great news.